Welcome to Joint Effort with Des Moines Orthopedic Surgeons. This podcast covers the pain and injuries that are associated with muscles, ligaments, and joints. I'd like to welcome our audience tonight. Uh, this is a Joint Effort uh, podcast by DMOS, and tonight we have a fellowship trained sports medicine orthopedist, Dr. Nick Honkamp, with us tonight. That sounds very impressive. <laughs> It is very impressive. Um, uh, Nick has been uh, uh, quite a mentor to me, actually, at DMOS, and so it's it's an honor having him on here. I just don't know if you're aware, you're the second guest, and you're actually following me, so you really can't do any wrong here. That's a good. That's that's a very good that, place for me. That make you feel that's better? a very good I place for me. You yes, I, I didn't want to ruin it. We, we want to let set the bar low. Um, so just give me a little background, Nick. I know you grew up in Dubuque. Uh, I did. Son of a guy who was in fine in the financial world. How, yep. How did you find your way down this journey to orthopedics? Um, I would say my mom was a nurse, so that helped. Um, and I had older sisters, older siblings who were in medicine, so that helped. Um, I got hurt in playing sports, so that probably contributed uh, somewhat to it. Um, and I I just knew I didn't want to do. Um, my dad was in accounting, and he was a, uh, it cast a pretty long shadow and I didn't want to, uh, I just wanted to let him have that and, and do something different. Right on. So it, Wallert and Dubuque took you on to Notre Dame and from two Notre Dame guys going a minute and a half without talking about it's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good so far. Um, we just lost half the audience but, and the other half is like glued in. You know, it's okay. It's okay. Um, but I wanted to ask you, so you were a student trainer for the football team. I was. And you were there when Lou Holtz was there. It was his last four years were my four years of college. Yeah, that had to have been an amazing experience. It was. It was. Uh, it was a lot of hours because I mean, there's a lot of downtime and and not as much fun time at practice, and it, it can get old. But yeah, for the most part, it was awesome. I'd do it again. I think what a lot of people may not know around town though is that you you have a pretty darn good impersonation. I, I can do Holtz uh, yeah. occasionally. I'm going to ask you a question later in the show, and I want you to respond in the Lou Holtz impersonation for me. I think he'd actually appreciate it too. It's that good. I, I hope he's watching. <laughs> we, we can probably get him. We can tag him <laughs> or something. Uh, so from, from there, on to Iowa for med school, mm-hmm. and then Wisconsin residency, Pittsburgh for fellowship. Yep. And uh, my understanding is fellowship was pretty good, but he got beat up a little bit, had to work pretty hard. Yeah, I think like a lot of fellowships, you know, they, they worked you, they had you cover lots of teams, and uh, Pitt was a big research place, so they, they definitely got you worked over pretty good for you know getting papers out and chapters and writing things for you know the um, yeah the big name guys for for books that they would read over so yeah it was well you went to one of the better fellowships in the country so I'd assume you're you're working pretty hard the first one of the first chapters I read in a textbook when I got to Des Moines had your name in front of (laughs) (laughs) and and it lost credibility right away (laughs) and then I saw Fu was on it so I was like I'll read it but I don't know the first guy the second guy sounds good yeah yeah exactly um so t- tonight's topic, we really want to get into talking about shoulder instability, okay? And I know that that's a specialty and something you really enjoy taking care of. Um, and so, you know, give me a little background on, you know, when we say shoulder instability, um, give me a little background on what does that mean? What structure has to be injured in the shoulder and where can it be injured to cause someone's shoulder to pop out of the joint? Yeah, so the, the way I always explain it to parents and kids is um, the, the bone part of the ball and socket is, is um, pretty unstable. It's like a golf ball on a golf tee. It's pretty easy to knock the golf ball off. So Mother Nature kind of created this ring around the socket called a labrum to kind of help deepen the socket uh, and make it a little diff- more difficult for that ball to come out. Um, and the labrum's kind of rubbery um, um, in consistency and it's stuck right on the periphery of the socket. And so for the ball to escape or get out um, and dislocate one way or another, it's got to essentially get up and over or, you know, in, in real um, layman's terms, kind of run the labrum over and, and uh, tear it or rip it away from the socket. So when, we, when people talk about shoulder instability, it's usually you're talking about a tear of that labrum or separation of that labrum from the yeah. socket. How, how does that happen to someone? Like what, what are certain things that can, you know, activities that can cause a shoulder to pop out? Um, oftentimes, obviously, contact sports are big. So um, wrestling's big because those guys get, you know, in their arms in all sorts of weird positions and, um, um, and it pops out. Um, football, obviously, hockey, um, those are big ones. But even, um, even just falls, you know, anything, basketball, volleyball, anything where you can have a fall, um, 
you know, it can generate enough force for it yeah. to pop out. So one of the interesting things to me is um, everyone has a difference of opinion in a first time dislocator. That's someone who's dislocated once. And let's say it was a traumatic injury. How do you treat those patients? And do you offer them surgery initially? Because I think there's been a little bit of a paradigm shift in how this should be treated. Yeah, I think well, at least when I was in training, I'm a little older than you are. Um, I think people still, for the most part, said if a kid dislocates one time, uh, try to treat that non-operatively. Uh, I think over the course of uh, my fellowship and then as I've gotten into practice, I think people have gotten more aggressive, uh, mainly because um, the big risk factors for coming out again, um, you know, contact sports, um, young age, um, sometimes even um, kids that aren't done growing yet, um, that's gotten more and more and more common. And so the risk that a kid who has a first time dislocation is gonna have a second or third or a fourth has, you know, I think gone up considerably to the point where, you know, you can, in certain kids, in certain sports, you can say, you know, there's probably a 80 plus percent chance you're gonna come, you're gonna dislocate again. Yeah. And um, it, you know, it's gonna happen at a time that's probably not, not good, you know, in the middle of the season. And plus, we've kind of learned that with each dislocation, uh, you are putting the joint a little more at risk of having some wear and tear down the line as they get older. Yeah. And so what, what are things like when someone dislocates two, three, four, five times, why does that make it, make it so much harder for you to have a successful result if you're going to go in there and fix it? Like what anatomical things happen that versus the first time dislocator that makes it that much more difficult? So I think things people have learned over time, one, the, the, that labrum that tears away, uh, the more it gets run over, the, the more beat up it gets and, yeah. and the less quality it is to repair. So uh, in some ways, I think, you know, the, the ways that we've repaired it and the sutures and the anchors and the things that we've used, th those have gotten pretty good, but you're still limited a little bit by the quality of the tissue. And so if, if somebody is dislocated three, four, six, eight times, that means that labrum has gotten beat up three, four, six, eight times. And so when you get in there, sometimes the the, the most limiting step is just the quality of the tissue. So that's one. Um, I would say we've learned probably over the last, um, you could chime in here, probably five years about how important um, bone you're loss. You're experienced, aren't you? No, you're smarter <laughs> and more experienced than me. Um, but bone loss, so the more times, a, um, a, the ball will dislocate out of the socket, it wears on the edge of that socket and you can actually cause some um, subtle but definite bone loss on the socket. And what I tell patients um, or families in that is, you have a golf tee and a golf ball, even if you chip off a little bit of the edge of that yeah. golf, golf tee, the ball gets even more unstable, sometimes to the point where it's even hard to keep it on, on the tee. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take much of that golf tee to get cracked off to make it that unstable and the same thing in the, in the shoulder. Yeah, so let me give you a scenario. You got a, um, a freshman in college, wrestler, first time dislocator, MRI shows a pretty routine labrum tear. What, what do you, if he says, hey, what should I do? What are you telling him? I would probably say fix it because I think you're going to come out again. And um, I think we can, uh, we've learned that, you yeah, know, can humbly. You that, can you make that risk zero? No. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, depending on, you know, their anatomy and, and bone loss and those types of things and their, you know, compliance with how long you can keep them out and let them heal and, 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 uh, and the rehab part of it. But I think you can at least tell them you can pretty confidently take it from a, in that kid, probably 80 plus percent chance that that's going to come out again down to probably, you can chime in here, 10, 15 percent. I think that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. When it, sometimes you tell people that and they're like... <laughs> You know, they can't believe you're saying a 10% right. failure rate, right? right. Um, but the reality is some of these sports they're going back to are pretty aggressive. And if you've torn something that's normal, you can right. figure that if you repair it, you could, you know, tear yeah. it again. Um, what do you require, um, you know, like if if someone says, I've, my shoulder keeps popping in and out of me, uh, when should they see, if they're pretty functional in between dislocation episodes, like, when should they see a doctor? I mean, that's that's a common question too. I think some people tolerate, they say it slips in and out and they can get it back in themselves. Um, when should they come see you? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I think there's probably some controversy. I'd be interested in your take as well. Um, but I think there's a lot of people that run around and probably sublux, you know, once or twice a year that never come and see us. Um, so part of it too is, is I agree with you, I, how bad is the dislocation? How long does it keep them down? You know, some people, you've, we've both seen kids that, that they're dislocated and they, they'll come back in even 
you know, on their own and for two weeks they're, you know, they're out. I mean, it's just a, their shoulder doesn't work. And so if those people I think come in, but it's the people that slip in and out pretty easily and within a couple of days they feel good. Um, it is, it's hard to convince those patients, hey, you know, we should do something because they're pretty functional. Um, what you worry about obviously is just what I worry about long term is, I mean, if they come out eight or 10 times, what's that shoulder gonna look like when they're 40 or 50? Are they gonna, are they gonna have an arthritic shoulder? Right, yeah, absolutely. So you said this labrum, you know, in it, the ligaments attached to it stabilize your shoulder. Um, tell, tell the audience a little bit about the different types of instability being in the front anterior or in the back posterior and who might be susceptible to either. Yep, so good way to classify it, kind of front and back. So front or anterior, back or posterior. So front, going out the front is still way more common than um, coming out the back, although I, I would say we're recognizing more and more that people can dislocate out the back more commonly than we thought. But I would still say that, you know, there's easily four or five front anterior dislocations to every posterior. Um, those typically are memorable, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people know their shoulder pops out and then sometimes it comes in on their own, sometimes not. Um, it's a noticeable event. You ask somebody, have you ever dislocated your shoulder? If they've done it out the front, they remember. Um, posterior is a little sneakier. And I think part of that is, um, I think the shoulder probably slips part way out, but not to the same degree that it pops out the front. And so um, they have more pain, but they don't, they won't give you that, that history of, yeah, I really felt it pop in and out. And okay. so I, I kind of look at it as anterior dislocations are usually traumatic, memorable. Um, kids know the minute it happens, um, they feel it come out and come back in um, and they feel unstable. They will feel it like, I don't trust it, it's gonna slip out again. Whereas out the back or posteriorly, it's more pain. They will say it hurts. They won't necessarily give you that history that, yeah, I felt it pop in and out yeah. sometimes, but not nearly as much. Yeah, so when someone says, you know, I feel it, it's gonna slip on me, show, show us what, what position are we talking about? Describe for us, you know, when, when are they gonna feel susceptible to that? If, if, assuming it's in the front and anterior labrum tear. Yeah, so it's usually um, some degree of arm away from your body and some degree of rotating out. So the, the easy thing I say is, if I'm talking about the right arm is, um, think about it, you're in the car and you go back to get a seatbelt. Mm -hmm. It's that it's that up and out mo movement to get yeah. the seatbelt. That's, I think people can get that. They're yeah. like, oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, you hear some of these stories about people dislocating for a first time and they go somewhere and they can't get it reduced and they get transferred to a different hospital and then all of a sudden it's four or five hours later. You know, I was wondering in my mind, I don't know if we have any evidence of this, but do you think that the time to reduction has an impact on potentially bony defects that they may develop? Yep. I think the longer, so if you just think of the ball sitting, ball socket, if you think of that ball sitting on the front of the socket and it's it's not coming back in, and then the longer it's out, all the muscles around are starting to tighten and tighten, and so that ball's just getting shoved into that socket more and more and more. And one of two things is gonna happen or both, that socket's gonna to start to, that bone's gonna get crushed down a little bit or worn away, or you're gonna get a, a, an indentation in the back of the ball. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, the quicker it's in, the better. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so tell me, so you, you've decided we're gonna go to the OR with uh, a labrum tear, and um, there's many different techniques to fix a labrum tear not necessarily controversial, it's just how do you approach things. In your hands, what's your preferred technique and how are you gonna accomplish uh, repairing them? I do whatever you tell me, Jason. <laughs> I show you the MRI and I wait for you to tell me what yeah. to do. Well, you do, you know, funny story about Nick is uh, one of my first weeks here, I'm actually operating, it may have even been a labrum tear, and he, 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 he busts in the door and he says, I'm from the government, how can I help? And I looked over and luckily I knew him and I kind of knew he was joking around. He was actually coming in to check on a new partner, make sure everything was going well. Uh, but he did that to one of our newer partners <laughs> about a year or two ago. Uh, and uh, I think it was Shane Cook. Yep. And uh, he was so zoned in, you know, he was totally into the yeah, case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, good for him. And you say, I'm here from the government and uh, you end up leaving and the nurse, he looks over the nurse and he goes, who the hell is that? <laughs> Right, and and and, uh, and they're like, um, that's the president of the company that you're employed by right now, you know. So I mean, that's pretty funny, a uh, little experience for Shane because he came up to me, he's like, I had no idea it was Hong Camp. I was sitting out in the on the yeah. hallway, and nurses would come out and they're laughing. I'm like, what? What's so funny? And they're like, oh, they told me the story. Yeah, that yeah. was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, all right, so not to digress, but so in, in your hands, and, and you know, I know you practice well enough, a majority of these um, you tend to fix arthroscopically. Is that correct? Yep, so that would be, I think, the big dividing line is um, some guys still will make an incision. So just think of like an open incision um, and, and just looking at it with their eyes and fixing it that way versus, you know, making a small incision, putting a, a small camera yeah. in and, and doing it what we call arthroscopically. Okay. Yep. And so when you're doing that, like, I, I get asked a lot, you know, how are you actually going to fix this labor? I'm like, what do you do? You know, how, what do you lodge into the bone? I mean, is there... Uh, do you have specific, uh, you know, types of anchors you like to use, or can you describe for people what it takes to fix a labrum? Yeah, so essentially you're trying to bring that labrum back down to the socket and, and get it to, to heal together. So, um, I mean, in, in probably real simple steps, um, the first thing you have to do is sometimes that the labrum has tried to heal, so it's scarred, so you have to kind of free it up mm -hmm. um, so that you can put it back where it belongs. So you got to mobilize it or free it up. Um, the second thing is, you know, people say um, you want to irritate things a little bit. So you want to irritate the tissue and the bone enough that you're causing a bleeding response. So you yeah. get a good healing. And then third is fixing. And uh, you can do that in different ways. Um, most people will use anchors, whether it's open or arthroscopic. Um, and you're talking small anchors. I tell people, you know, these are three, four, five millimeter anchors. So we, we drill a little hole and then typically the hole is um, um, slightly smaller than the anchor. So the anchor gets put in and it, and it kind of sits in there snug and then that anchor has suture attached to it so we take that suture and we weave it different ways through the mm -hmm. through the labrum and and literally um, either bring it back to the anchor or tie a knot and, and how long does that procedure it. take you typically depends on the severity but i'd say you know hour hour and a half yeah and so if you get in there and then you look at the back of the humeral head the ball and you see a huge shark bite out of that because they were dislocated for six hours multiple reduction attempts and then you kind of maneuver the arm in a certain way and you see that that ball in that divot is going to engage are you worried about the integrity of your repair long term yep so i would say you know the last five years people have really kind of documented that about you can do a great labor repair but if people have that shark bite out of the back of the ball um, it can kind of as the ball rotates it can kind of fall into that defect and contribute to a dislocation so um, people have tried different things i think um I think both of us would agree that probably the best thing is um, right adjacent to the back of the ball or, or the part of the rotator cuff that, that attaches um, really all over the ball. But you can kind of steal a little Rob Peter to pay Paul a little bit, take yep. that tendon or that um, tissue from the rotator cuff and kind of advance it into that shark bite a little bit to kind of fill the defect a little bit. Um, and you are, again, Rob and Peter to pay Paul a little bit. So there's a little evidence, I'd say, that you know they can get a little stiff with that. But fair trade-off really for for hopefully Without better stability if it's going to help you yeah keep stability. it in now last question about when you're in there uh, what if you get in there and you see that 20 percent of the front part of the bone where you're supposed to put the labrum down to is gone and usually you know about that ahead of time mm -hmm. right so i guess the better question would be how would you prepare for that if you're concerned about that in clinic what, what are the studies you get and what are you talking and telling patients about ahead of time yeah so i, I what I'm concerned about bone loss is the people that have come out multiple times, right? The more times that ball is, is ridden over the edge of the socket and dislocated, it's just like anything, it's gonna wear down the edge. Um, and the socket's not very big, so even if you lose a few millimeters, it can be a big deal. So kids that come in and say, yeah, I've, I've come out, you know, four or five times, or I've come out and they've had to put it in, um, you know, have it reduced, it didn't pop in by itself, that makes me worried that they have bone loss, they've, they've lost some bone, particularly on the socket. And so just like that golf tee that has a split on the edge, it doesn't take much for, um, even with a great labrum repair, for that ball to still be unstable. Um, and so I think um, we've learned a lot from um, um, Europeans, you know, we always joke that they can do whatever they want, right? Yeah. Um, there's like no FDA in, in Europe and, and you know, we, we do things on dogs, they do things on, on Europeans. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think in the, they really contributed a lot to to um, using bone from a different part of the body or adjacent part of the of the shoulder and taking that bone and 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 actually kind of feeding or um, fitting it into the front of the socket to kind of make the socket either its original size or maybe even a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. So you know, just wheeling back a little bit, you know, the approach open versus arthroscopic. I think the unfortunate thing maybe uh, with newer arthroscopic techniques is, you know open surgery by no means is a bad word, right? I mean, there there's just as good a success rate, if not better, in the literature in regards to doing an open bank art. 
Um, and uh, I think that's a fantastic procedure as well. Um, tell me, you know, is there a, a time where you're thinking I, I should go, I should do this open? You know, I, you know, is there like, uh, is there a certain size of bony bank art that you'll go open, or is there a scenario where a failure? You tell me in your experience when you decide to go open instead of arthroscopic. Yeah, I think in some ways, if there's a, um, some people will dislocate and they will tear that labrum off, but with that labrum comes a sliver of bone. Mm -hmm. If the sliver's small, you know, two, three, four millimeters, um, you can oftentimes handle that arthroscopically, but you're a little limited just by um, the instruments that you can get in through a small little poke hole to get into the shoulder arthroscopically. Can it get through a bigger, sure. a, big, a bigger piece? So once that starts getting, you know, I don't think four millimeters, five, um, I think sometimes that is, is easier to fix open because yeah. you're looking right at it and you're not limited by the size of the little poke hole that you're putting instruments in. So that would be one. Um, I do think in some ways, if you really want to tighten down some of the soft tissues and 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 really kind of Even artificially- Even repair maybe on the way out helps a little bit. Right? right, so you know, you have the advantage of um, with an open surgery, you're going through some of the muscles. So when you repair those muscles when you're finished with the surgery, yeah. I do think open, you can probably tighten them, over tighten them a little bit sure. um, if you choose to do that. Now there's obviously risks, you know, about arthritis as they get older, but um, I, I think a well done open probably could over tighten those tissues a little bit better than an arthroscopic. Yeah. So you've, you've done the surgery on this kid, this, uh, you know, freshman wrestler, whatever it may be. And uh, how do you pin him down? I mean, how do you, what is your protocol post-op? Duct tape. Yeah. <laughs> other than just duct taping their arm to their body, what, you know, what is your protocol for sling use and how quickly is therapy coming in? Um, so I, I uh, try to keep them in for six weeks. And to me, if there's anything, it, the, that discussion starts pre-op with mom and dad. Like, mm -hmm. look, six weeks is going to act like six months to you. But if you're not willing to wear this thing for six weeks, don't do it. Because yeah. the worst thing you can do is go through this expense and all the surgery and and, and not a huge risk of uh, with this type of surgery, but there is some risk with any surgery. You don't want to go through all that if you're not going to comply. So you got to buy in from the get-go. So I think, to me, that's probably the biggest thing I've learned in practice is that discussion starts early and you, you kind of remember or remind them, hey, remember this conversation. You, you're going to want to cheat and you're going to want to get out early. Um, so I would say um, six weeks for sure. Um, if I'm if I'm pretty convinced they're going to cheat, I'll even tell them seven or eight and hope that I get five or six. Hopefully they're not listening. Um, um, and then uh, if anything, I, I don't think, and I'd be interested in your take. I, if there's one thing I've learned, especially you know, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old kids, they rarely get stiff. I mean, I think you could keep them in a sling for yeah, two months. I can't stand when they come back at three months and they're doing, you know, they yeah. have a, sometimes when they have all their motion back, you're almost kind of like, that's, that's probably okay. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, definitely at six weeks when they have it back, you're, you're kind of thinking, oh boy, they, you know, have been using the sling, what's right. going on here and stuff. So, so I, I, if anything, the first six weeks have gotten less aggressive with therapy, not that therapists are great and, and, and we're going to need them to get through this successfully, but especially that first six weeks, if anything, I'm just yeah. trying to slow them down. So uh, I do very little the first six weeks. Um, I don't want to tempt them. I don't want to, you know, let them kind of get the idea that, oh, this isn't so bad. Yeah, and, right, exactly. Um, so exactly. if you can put the fear of God into them a little bit the first six weeks and, and, and get them through that, um, I, I just don't think they but get But ultimately, stiff. you're letting them go back to sports yep. sometime around the six month time frame or? Yeah, but again, uh, you struggle with that. I mean, trying to get them to wait a full six months is hard. If I can get five, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I'm doing pretty well, but yes. I'm with you. The, the book answer is six, yeah. but sometimes, you know, for a 16 year old kid, six months is like 4% of their life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know. I know. So uh, it does seem like forever it's, to them. Absolutely. Well, this has been a lot of fun talking to you about this. I'm not gonna let you off the hook yet though. Are you going over for spring break? Uh, my no, wife. I don't want to, are you going somewhere for spring break? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. In Lou Holtz impersonation, please tell me where in the audience, where you're going for spring break. Let, let, let me tell you here. We're gonna take the entire family, and and we're gonna we're gonna fly out, and we're gonna go to Yosemite National Park. It's an absolute national treasure. <laughs> That's fantastic. I can't imagine Lou doing. He would love hearing that. Absolutely. Love I hope he's listening. That, so. Yeah. 
we'll, we'll get them to listen for sure. Thank you very much. This wraps up uh, DMOS's joint effort podcast number two. Thank you. Doug. Thanks for having me. You got it. Thank you.